السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جمعة مبارك الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم All praises to be to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our bad deeds. And whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray. And whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one having no partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is Allah's servant and messenger. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullah haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Ya ayyuhal nas utaku rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidata wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisa'a. Wa attaku allah alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham inna allaha kana alaykum raqiba. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد O ye who believe be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah O humanity be mindful of your creator who created you from a single soul and from it created its mate and through both Allah spread countless men and women throughout the world and be mindful of Allah in whose name you appeal to one another and honor your ties of kinship surely Allah is ever watchful over you O ye who believe be mindful of Allah and say what is right Allah will bless you for bless your deeds for you and forgive your sins and whoever obeys Allah and the messenger of Allah has truly achieved a great triumph Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli have you ever felt like you don't belong, like your friends or your colleagues or anybody else in your community uh, is going to discover that you're some kind of a fraud, that you've put up a front, a mask your whole life, uh, and you actually don't deserve whatever it might be that you've achieved in life, if it's your job, your accomplishments, your income, where, your position? Do you ever feel that that those feelings are you know prevalent in your mind that you're having those feelings have you ever felt that as a muslim you that despite everything that you do you just aren't good enough or worthy for the religion of islam or to be a part of a community do you find yourself in other settings and situations relaying thoughts and statements like i'm not qualified what am i doing here i don't belong here I'm a total fraud and sooner or later everybody's going to find out and I'm not qualified at all. Again, what gives me the right to be here? Statements like these might be a symptom of something that's actually quite prevalent in our society apart from just being self-reproaching or self-doubting. They actually might be indicative of what is called imposter syndrome, imposter phenomenon or imposter experience, which is not a disease or an abnormality by any means. It's not something that's diagnosed, uh, but it's something that we all experience in some way, shape or form. And we'll get into that in just a second, but full disclosure as always. I put together this uh, khutbah topic because it was something that I needed to hear first and foremost. Uh, every time that I have to give a khutbah, every time I have to be in a different setting, these feelings are running amok in my mind. And so uh, being at the forefront and putting this there is something that I uh, felt the need to address for myself first and foremost. And inshallah, it can be of benefit to us uh, as we navigate this, uh, this topic together. But as a community chaplain, that has to go to other spaces and places such as interfaith gatherings, this very uh, Zoom room for khutbah or community groups, prisons, college campuses and the such, and talk about and teach parts of our faith. I sometimes feel neck deep and maybe even submerged in imposter syndrome. I, I feel like what gives me the right to be here? Hey, like, you know, I, I, I'm not completely like qualified at all to be here. Like, why am I here? I don't I don't deserve this. 
and even when giving this clip, as I mentioned now, even after maybe uh, a year or two years after, you know, having done so, I still re wrestle with feelings of imposterism. It still feels kind of cringy to see my name as, as a, a, under the chutbah or whatnot that I, I don't feel qualified. I don't have the, the nice white hat or the robes or, you know, all the uh, ijazat that come with it. So wh why am I speaking on things which I feel that I don't even feel qualified to? Just like this topic uh, of being, uh, you know, in, in a, a victim of imposterism or feeling like you're an imposter. But I felt that if there's any topic to talk about imposterism on and having feeling uh, being an imposter on, it might be the topic of uh, imposterism itself. But the truth is that more of us feel like this than just myself or just you or just us as a collective. Uh, and imposter syndrome and imposterism is not something that we just feel maybe in the work setting when it's in, in, in light of other people. It might be something that we can feel in our day-to-day -day life, in our relationships with our spouses, with our loved ones, or even as Muslims practicing our faith. So real quick. Let's kind of go through and just uh, dive into what imposter syndrome is. Imposter syndrome is uh, also called, uh, as I mentioned, imposter phenomenon or imposter experience or perceived fraudulence, another way to put it. Uh, and it involves feelings of self-doubt, feelings of personal incompetence that persist, 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 despite the fact that you have a number of accomplishments, you have a stated record, you have a uh, great education, you've got something to kind of stand on. And, and these feelings of self-doubt submerge those and say, no, those aren't worthy, or they write those accomplishments off. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not an official diagnosis. So don't think of it like a disease, like, oh, this person was diagnosed with imposter syndrome or whatnot. It has a very strong connotation of being like a disease, but it's not an official disease that's listed in you know the DSM-5 or anything like that. And psychologists and others acknowledge that it's really a very real and specific form of intellectual self-doubt. So you might just think about it as, you know, you have self-doubt, that's like, I don't think I could do this. But then you have the, the, the next step to that. You have something that's more surgical in the aspect of looking at yourself and saying that I, I'm not at all qualified for that. And you recurringly fall into this, this thought. Uh, and there's other things that, that end up contributing to it. But as we'll see, that imposter syndrome essentially is this idea that you've only succeeded due to luck. You've only succeeded just by this chance and not because of your own talent or your own qualifications, that you haven't done anything really to get to where you are or something that you can stand on. And that all of this is kind of just like uh, just like a, a, a big act that's going on. It's, it's literally kind of like being an imposter, being like an actor on a stage and you're acting out all the motions, but you're, you know, you might be an ER and be an actor, but you're not really a doctor. Uh, and, and you're kind of navigating life under that presumption. Uh, we feel that we haven't earned our accomplishments under in, in, in this imposter syndrome, imposter fe imposterism feeling that our ideas, our skills, they aren't worthy of others that, you know, if we haven't earned stuff, why are we going to keep putting ourselves out? We're just going to stay in the shell that we are in because we're just not worthy of that. Um, we feel that we're well out of our league. We feel that we're not qualified to be there, but we are there. Uh, we feel like we're getting away with something and that eventually somebody is going to discover our reality. And in doing so, to try and run away from that discovery, we keep trying to do other things to prove to ourselves that, hey, uh, we, we, we belong here. When in fact, we might already have belonged. We're just kind of supplementing that. Uh, just think about like a graduate student or a medical student on their first day in the field or in the hospital, having to put their skills to the test and uh, having to actually deal with actual people or in, in the actual field. Uh, and they're feeling like they are unqualified or they don't belong here. We think that, as I mentioned, we're just actors, that it's simply easier not to try. Uh, imposter syndrome makes us feel like we're frauds, even though there's abundant evidence and a good track record of our success. Uh, but as we'll talk about, we sometimes write off that success. There's there's some explanation for it. There's, there's no way I could get to this position. So, some stars align somewhere and somebody made a big mistake, but here I am. Uh, what's really interesting is that early research that came out actually in the 70s exploring this phenomenon really primarily focused on accomplished, successful women. Uh, but it later became clear, though, that imposter syndrome is something that can affect anyone across gender, across sexual orientation, uh, across profession, anywhere from folks who are students, graduate students, to top executives. Uh, and, and since then, research has shown that both men and women experience imposter feelings. And 
imposter syndrome, as I mentioned, it can apply to anyone who isn't really able to internalize and own their successes. Um, and so around 70% of adults might experience imposterism at least once in their life, uh, according to some research. And so it's something that we can all feel. Uh, it's not something that uh, is, is exclusive to a certain group of people or whatnot. You may have predispositions, but it's something that we can all relate to at some way, shape, or form in our life, uh, that we're feeling uh, like we are imposters. And like I said, it doesn't have to just deal with a corporate view of it, that it's, it's only related to your job or to the material things. It can relate to the spiritual. It can relate to your relational. It can relate to uh, your work in, in outside of the field as well. So it, it can go across and holistically in your life. It just maybe lands in different parts of our different spheres of our life for different, uh, different uh, people. And so what does imposter syndrome do? We talked a little bit about it, but imposter syndrome stifles that potential for growth and meaning, and it helps, uh, it doesn't help, it actually inhibits people uh, from pursuing their uh, opportunities for growth that they might see to climb a ladder at. So it might inhibit uh, opportunities for growth in work, in relationships, or in common hobbies. Uh, imposter feelings, because they, uh, they often are accompanied by anxiety, uh, by fear, by depression, uh, that they, they say like, you know, if you have like a promotion coming up, they are the kinds of feelings that say, hey, you're not, you're not really worthy, you're not really qualified, just stick to what you have. Uh, uh, you, you don't, you're not even qualified for this job. What makes you think you're qualified for that? And so it just keeps you uh, where you are and keeps you stagnant, but it keeps you in this cycle that, uh, that doesn't bring about any benefit because you continuously doubt yourself. And so when you counter these feelings, when you try and say, no, like, look, I'm going to try and get better. You oftentimes end up working harder and holding yourself to ever higher standards. The pressure can eventually take a toll that uh, affects your emotional well-being. It affects your performance and it affects your, uh, your, your mental health, it affects your physical health, it affects your relationships with other people. So you do well, but you don't believe that you deserve your position, or you don't believe that you belong, uh, or that it's all by mistake, as we've mentioned. Um, and so imposter feelings really do represent a conflict between your own self perception and the way others perceive you. We have a concept in Islam about the nafs al amara, the nafs al lawama, and the nafs al mutma'inna, the the different uh, nufus or the selves that that we have, and how uh, in life we try to progress to uh, the highest stage, the the, the soul that's at rest, the soul that's at peace, the nafs al mutma'inna. But in order to get through that, we start at uh, the the baseline carnal self, which is the nafs al lamara. We go through the nafs al lawama, which is the uh, self-reproaching self. We just doubt ourselves, And so this is really in that nafs al lawama area in terms of self-reproach, thinking that we can't do it, that we're, we're, we're just not worthy of this, uh, and trying to transcend to that next step. Uh, but the, and so what we see here is that even that as others praise our talents and others may lift us up and say, hey, you know, that's awesome. Like, what would we do without you? What, like, that's amazing. You write off those successes because you're not grounded in them. You, you write off those successes as timing, good luck. You don't believe that you've earned them on your own merits. And you feel that others are going to find out that uh, what I'm thinking, it's that, that's what they're going to end up thinking as well. Because right now I'm just doing a big magic show. Eventually the show is going to uh, finish and they're going to realize the same thing that I realized. Uh, and so you, as I mentioned, you consequently uh, pressure yourself to work harder. You want people to keep uh, to keep them at bay and think that they, they won't recognize any shortcomings or failures. You want to become worthy of roles that you believe you don't deserve, but you might actually deserve them. You make up for what you consider your lack of intelligence when you might be just quite as intelligent as is needed. Uh, and you ease the feelings of guilt over tricking people. It's just by doing more stuff that I need to get to this threshold that people think I'm at, but I don't think I'm at. And so I need to keep getting there. But that might be uh, a, a sky's limit of what you what, what that threshold is. And so you might just con completely keep swimming uh, at something arbitrary that people already think that you are at. And so the work that you put in and can keep that cycle going. Your in further accomplishments don't reassure you. They're going to keep coming because there will always be something. When you have this mindset, it's nothing is ever good enough, that you have to keep doing something. And so you consider them nothing more uh, than efforts to kind of maintain the uh, illusion of your success. You're like, oh, I, I did something, but that that's not enough. Like, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this. And so, as I mentioned, any recognition you get, you might uh, you might offset it. You might say, oh, that's just sympathy. They're being, they're taking pity on me or, hey, that was just complete chance 
events and whatnot. Uh, and as I mentioned, over time, it can fuel this cycle of anxiety because you're worried about it. it. It also fuels a cycle of depression as well as guilt that you're just like, I'm, I'm just like a fraud. Like, how am I, how am I living with this stuff? How, how can I present this face to people? Uh, and you go into depression as well. So you're living in this constant fear of discovery, but you strive for per perfection in everything that you do. And you might feel guilty. You might feel worthless when you can't achieve it. Uh, and then not to mention feeling burned out and overwhelmed by your continued efforts. So as I'm saying this, think about the connection, not just to your work, but to your spiritual life, to your life uh, as a Muslim and your practices as a Muslim, when you feel like uh, you're just, you keep wanting to try and do something, do something, do something, but it's never enough. And so these true and false imposter feelings, they involve a lot of self-doubt, uncertainty about our talents, about our abilities, and a sense of unworthiness that doesn't align with what others think about us. There's a really big difference between secretly doubting our abilities and being made to feel as if our identity makes us unworthy of our position or accomplishments. There's factors that are outside of ourselves, such as our environments, our institutions, that can play a major role in creating these feelings. And as Muslims in America, this is something Something that we can oftentimes feel, as we'll talk about in a second. But in short, you really think that you fooled others into believing something. Oh, sorry, into believing something that you are not. And so we want to think about what what are some of those feelings that we have? What are some of the things that we uh, that we harbor that uh, are these are these feelings of imposter syndrome? So some examples of imposter syndrome. Uh, imposter syndrome expert uh, Valerie Young, she wrote a book on the subject called The Secret Thoughts of a Successful Woman, um, has found patterns in people who experience these feelings. So you have perfectionists who set extremely high expectations for themselves. And even if they meet like 98 or 99% of that, the one or 2% is what they harp on. And they feel like they're failures because they haven't done that. Uh, and any small mistake will make them question their own competence. You have experts who feel that they need to know every single thing about everything. Uh, and they won't apply for a job if they feel they don't meet every single criteria in the posting. And they might be hesitant to ask uh, a question in class or speak up because they don't want to look stupid because they they don't have the answer. You have people who are natural geniuses who are uh, struggling to work hard to accomplish something, and they think that this means that they aren't good enough. They used uh, they are used to skills coming easily, and when they have to put in effort, their brain tells them that they're an imposter. You have people who are soloists who feel like they can accomplish tasks on their own, and if they need to ask for help, that means that they're a failure or fraud. You also have super men, super women, super people who push themselves to work harder than those around them to prove that they're not imposters. And they, they feel the need to succeed in all aspects of life. They have to put this, this uh, fine image of like, uh, you know, this crystal line or this, this silver lining of uh, I am, you know, really have got it made, but they feel stressed out when they are not able to accomplish something that if something falls apart, that means the whole uh, apparatus has fallen apart. And it's really interesting that some of the most accomplished people in the world in history have experienced this. Uh, Albert Einstein referred to himself as an involuntary swindler. He said that, you know, he didn't feel like his discoveries uh, on relativity and whatnot didn't deserve the attention that they were getting. Uh, Maya Angelou, one said that I've run a game on everybody and they're gonna find find me out. And she wrote 11 books with so many different recognitions and prizes. And so you, you see that this isn't exclusive to just ordinary folks here. And there. this is also uh, something that people who in our minds in hindsight were the best of the best felt that every single day. And so now to be sure, uh, let, let's be sure that we think of this success. When we think about success, we're not just limiting imposter syndrome to this, uh, this concept of monetary or worldly success. Success is relative. Not just people who make tangible and noticeable accomplishments are subject to imposter syndrome. It might be you as a parent. It might be you as a teacher. It might be you as a spouse, just in, in, in a sense that uh, when people build you up, when you have this uh, role that you're living into, you can feel that you don't live into that. And so where does this imposter syndrome come from? There's not a single answer. We have uh, parenting and childhood environments that can affect it. We have, uh, have having early success in childhood um, can contribute to it because if you do really well early in life, but you're not as good later in life uh, by the same measure, uh, you, you might feel like this was all kind of like, uh, I, I, I guess I was just an imposter. Uh, personality traits, if you're very much a perfectionist, if you're very much uh, you know, questioning your own confidence, you can be more predisposed. If you have existing mental health symptoms, if you have, if you come, if you kind of wrestle with, uh, you know, or live with anxiety, depression, uh, or feeling 
feeling of this mindset of feeling less than, you can be more predisposed to falling into the cycle because imposter syndrome can worsen these mental health sy uh, symptoms and create a cycle that's really hard to escape. You also can be uh, kind of put, put out by um, new responsibilities. If someone says, hey, you're doing a really good job, you're going to do well in this job, and they put you in a new job or they give you this new responsibility, you might feel completely unworthy of that. Uh, you probably want the job. It could be your dream job, but at the same time, you don't, you won't measure up to the expectations because you don't think that you're, you're going to match uh, what the caliber is that's required. And so how does imposter syndrome relate to our spiritual practices and our faith experience as Muslims? So much of what I've stated today, you can substitute the words like accomplishment, successes, education, experience for things that are maybe more in our, uh, in the Islamic frame. You can think about, uh, you know, being awarded things. You can think about, you know, being invited to events. You can think about leading classes, uh, or you can think about it as, as simple as our, our basic practices, our salah, our Quran recitation, our tajweed, our victory our charity, any metric that we might measure our Muslimness with, or we might judge ourselves by, and we can see how this affects us in our faith experience. In our society today, and for much of our lives in, our, in this country, we've probably had that moniker of being a token Muslim wherever we might be. Just so, uh, just by simply practicing our faith, just by being the neighbor that's next door, and people might start to see you as the reference point for Islam. They might start to see you as the reference point for all Muslims, and so they start to invite you to interfaith panels. They start to ask you to come to their church or come to their school, teach a class, um, come come uh, introduce Islam to us, teach us about Islam, and you think that you fooled others into believing you are something that you are not, even though you have been practicing your faith faithfully, uh, and you've been doing your best, you just haven't been, you know, uh, out there with it, you've just been doing your ordinary thing. So regardless of where we might be on the spectrum of religious practice, or in our experience as Muslims, we're not immune to having feelings of imposterism, especially if we're sincerely trying, and really making significant progress or accomplishments where that might be deserved to share with others. Now, naturally, our faith is one that does point all praise to Allah, but it doesn't have to come at the expense of self self-degradation or just completely reducing that you have nothing to offer or that you're not unique or that you are not somebody who can bring something uh, of worthwhile to this world. We might minimize what we've done or accomplished because we compare ourselves to other people. We might not feel like we're worthy of teaching Islam or showing someone because we're not good enough. We can't lead that kid's class or we can't give a lecture. Or we can't do something because that's only for someone who's done this. That's only for the ivory tower uh, scholars. That's only for these kinds of people. Um, I don't belong in this community because I'm not religious enough or good enough. These types of feelings manifest in the spiritual sense when we feel that imposter syndrome within our own experience. We might have just finished reading the Quran and we might be ready to start memorizing it or helping others to learn it or helping them memorize it, but we shame ourselves because we feel like others have finished it sooner than us and we're not worthy and we're, you know, you, there's, there's a difference between saying, hey, this person's more qualified to do it. There's another uh, difference in a sense of like, I, I, I'm I not at all like qualified somebody that this is just complete luck. Like, yeah, I finished it, but hey, I finished it late. You know, you completely uh, debase yourself and you completely reproach yourself uh, as opposed to a healthy thing. Like, hey, you know, I'm still learning, acknowledging where you're at. Uh, this person might be better for it, but you reduce those opportunities as ways to kind of put arrows to yourself. You're saying that this is a reason why I'm not good enough. You turn it on your on itself uh, and you turn it on its head and it points back to yourself that I can't do these things because of XYZ. If we are new converts to the faith and we've been making huge strides in learning the prayer, we might feel like impersonators or frauds or uh, because we're not 100% perfect in how we uh, do all the things in Islam. Um, when people praise us or when an opportunity comes for us to demonstrate how we know some of these things. Uh, and similarly, for those of us who are born into the faith and raised in the faith, others might try to uh, be learning or learn from us um, or put us on a pedestal. As I mentioned, you know, it's probably not, uh, it's probably not a rare occurrence that one of y'all here, most of y'all here have been asked to talk about Islam to a uh, news station or to a local church or by a classmate. And can you give me the answers? What does Islam say about this? What does Islam say about that? And we might make ourselves feel that we're not worthy because we're just, we're just ordinary folks. And so 
we mentioned that constantly living in this fear of discovery, that people are going to find out that we're imposters and, hey, we're not that scholar that's next door. We're just an ordinary Muslim. We strive for perfection in everything that we do. This can be a good thing, but this is also a bad thing because we are literally just like uh, the Tasmanian devil. We're running over the cliff and the road has not yet been built. And we're just kind of putting it under us as we're going, as we're going, as we're going, uh, and not realizing that there's no foundation under that. So we just keep this, uh, th this show going in our minds that we're just going to keep going as long as we can uh, until we realize that, you know, hey, th there's no ground underneath us. Uh, so we feel a pressure not just to get by, but, but we feel a pressure to push the envelope and be perfect. And we see this come out, especially in Ramadan. We don't want to just read all five salah. We want to do all the extra nawafil on top of a juz of Quran every day, on top of all the duas, and on top of all this stuff. And when we do that, we oftentimes burn ourselves out. And this boom and bust cycle continues, and our spirituality is eventually burnt out. Uh, and we're, we're just end up frustrated, like, okay, let me try again. And we're going to try and pull it all again, because other people are judging us. We think other people are watching us, and that other people have set these expectations for us, and we have to uh, race to meet them. We go to extremes to prove something that we think that we're not yet we might have been that the whole time. We might have been what people had thought of us. We might have been what we think we are, but we uh, just have not realized that because we're feeling this shortcoming. And so we talked about what kind of things are predisposed to imposterism, and those included perfectionism. Now, tied, as I mentioned, we tied this back to spiritual and faith practices, especially in Islam, when it comes to our prayers, when we come to how do we uh, practice this faith, but some, some of us kind of have a higher degree of wanting to do it absolutely perfect. And uh, that sometimes eats away at the spiritual element and takes away uh, any of the kind of benefit we feel like we can derive uh, outside of that. And so we might feel, be, feel that we are compelled to do even more than we're already doing and to do so much more that we need to burn ourselves out because we, we, we feel like we're not enough. So thinking about, as, as we wrap up here, thinking about some Islamic injunctions to help combat imposter syndrome. Important above all else is to remember moderation. The Prophet ﷺ had taught that the good deeds of any one person will not make them enter paradise. And his companions were a bit puzzled by this. They said, not even you, Rasulullah, that uh, what about you, Prophet of God? You, what, th does that count for you? And the Prophet ﷺ said, not even myself, unless God bestows his favor and mercy on me. So be moderate in your religious deeds and do whatever is within your ability. And none of you should wish for death, for if he is a doer of good, he may increase his good deeds. And if he is an evildoer, he may repent to Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, not, not even me, like, you know, but, but be moderate, be moderate. And the Quran lifts up that uh, the Muslim community, that uh, this community that was given to the Prophet ﷺ was one that is uh, ummatan wasatan, that it is a community of the middle way, a, a moderate community um, that will be witnesses over the people, that will be uh, examples for the people, and the Prophet ﷺ will be an example and a witness over us, as Surah Al-Baqarah talks about. And we also see in Surah Al-Maida, where the Quran uh, talks about, where Allah talks about how the people who had preceded is, uh, the Muslims had, uh, you know, had, had taken their faith to extremes, but it lifts up really crucially that amongst them, there's still a moderate group of people. There's still a group of people that are in the middle way. And you see this concept of moderation is lifted up, that people who aren't self-obsessing on this, who aren't taking things to extremes, that they're finding a fine balance. And in that balance that you you will see healthy states occur across the board. And so, as we mentioned, that imposter syndrome oftentimes uh, takes uh, takes this uh, this concept um, from, you know, just a self-doubt and pushes it to an extreme. Uh, there's one thing to be humble and say, you know, that, you know, someone's like, man, you are like the best, uh, you know, football player, the athlete in the world. You are the best employee ever. And you're like, hey, man, you know, that that's not me. I'm, I'm just trying to do what I can. There's a difference between that and being like, oh my God, like, you know, just like starting to have anxiety over and be like that, like, you know, I am not, so I have to keep doing, I have to keep doing, I have to keep doing and facing reality. So uh, it's really important to, to look at that um, moderation, but also we really think that the best of us don't feel like they belong uh, or that they, like, we really feel like um, the best of us don't feel like they don't belong or that they don't deserve or they aren't worthy. But what's actually interesting is that they do, whether they are our parents, whether they are bosses, our coworkers, our shuyuk, our scholars, um, as well as our pious predecessors, people who were, who were at the top of the top also had these feelings and also do have these feelings. This might not be, uh, in the examples I'm about to get, they might not be full-blown imposter syndrome, but we can grasp bits and pieces of what it may have looked like and manifested in these individuals uh, when they're in doubt. 
they didn't feel like they deserved what was coming for them, but they did. They in fact did. We have the example of uh, Yunus alayhi salam, that he was told to go preach to Nineveh. He was told to go preach. And the first thing he did was run, he ran away. He ran away. Uh, and the story being that, you know, he, he, he went, uh, you know, overboard in, 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 in a boat and spent uh, time in isolation in the belly of a whale. But uh, he, he didn't feel like that was he was able to do it. He couldn't do it. Like, he, he was just like, it's not me. I can't do it. And so he literally ran away um, and, and eventually had to come back. But we see that initial anxiety. The Prophet Sallallahu from the first moment of revelation, being told, read. And he said, I can't read. Like, I'm not, I'm not someone who reads. I'm not someone who, who recites. I'm not someone who does that. Uh, all the way to the feelings of being a madman, being someone who is in possession. Uh, we see that when he ran down the hill uh, to his home, that Khadija was the one who reaffirmed him, that uh, said that, you know, while, while he himself is thinking, I've gone mad, I've seen some kind of jinn, I've seen something that's like blown my mind, I'm going crazy. She comforted him. She said, no, you, you feed the orphan, you uphold ties of kinship, you're a good person, God wouldn't do this to you. Uh, and we see him continue to struggle with this, even after receiving this affirmation that when he receives revelation, there would be a period of silence in which he, he's being called a madman by some, he's being called a person of God by some, he doesn't know what's happening. And some accounts relate that he, he goes to a cliff and he just, he just looks, you know, as if like that, that's going to be the end of it. Uh, but he has this encounter um, that, that, that shows that, no, you know, you, we have not forsaken you. Uh, Surah ad duha uh, speaks to this element that your Lord has not abandoned you nor forsaken you. Uh, we see after Taif, where the Prophet ﷺ is just sitting with his, his feet are uh, drenched in blood, and he's just sitting, uh, just thinking, like, what, what has this all been for? Uh, and he uh, offers a prayer to Allah that says, I complain to you. I complain to you, and who, who are you going to leave me to uh, that I have to have to do this? Like, am I basically the right person for the job? I, I, I'm not the right person. Um, who, why, would, why would I be left like this? And lastly, we see in uh, Hudaybiyah, uh, after the Prophet Sallallahu had struck a deal with the Meccans, the Prophet Sallallahu came out and the, uh, the, the Muslims were very disappointed to not have been able to complete their Umrah. They were very disappointed that the, uh, there, there were some prisoners that were not, uh, that were not taken back with them, um, that were Muslim, they were not freed. Uh, and so the Muslims were very upset. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, hey, we're going to wrap up, just uh, complete your ritual sacrifices, shave your heads, and we're going back. And he commanded this three times. Nobody, nobody did anything. They were very disappointed pointed they were sad and they just they just did not look at him and so he went back into his tent he was distraught he said i don't know he he talked to um salama his wife he said i don't know what to do he's like they're not listening to me i guess i've lost them like what what do i do and she comforts him she says no you know you you are the prophet salam of god go out there lead by example do your thing they will follow he followed her advice and that's exactly what they did and it was a day of celebration but we see these feelings of doubt these feelings of self doubt were not something that were exclusive to uh, just people who have been disconnected from that experience it's it's been very sacred we see the same in the stories of of Musa when Allah appoints him to be uh, you know the the basically um, the one to convey the message to Pharaoh and he says I have a speech impediment, get my brother, like I, I'm not qualified at all for this, despite the fact that Musa was someone who was a member, a, a, de, facto, a de facto member of the, the Pharaoh's royal court when he was, you know, found by Asia, uh, that he had a connection there, he was raised in that house, uh, but he was a shepherd, so he, he understood uh, patience, he understood how to uh, build people up and especially, um, you know, work with folks who were not, uh, in, in a sense, of that same caliber. So he had a diverse array of skills. He also then overlooked his own strengths and connections and instead just said, no, my brother's better. Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not worthy at all. Uh, we see Maryam as well. And that, when she was enunciated by uh, Jibril, told the bird of, uh, told about that Jesus would be born to her and her at the base of a palm tree about nine months later saying that I wish that I was never born. I wish that I was basically dead. Uh, and so you see these, these doubts that are there. They might not be full-blown imposter syndrome, but you can see them manifest in different ways uh, in our tradition, especially in the prophetic stories. And so just to be mindful of time, I want to close here with some, uh, some 
some basic steps in terms of overcoming imposter syndrome spiritually and mentally, uh, and maybe an intersection with what we at Muslim Space here offer. So when we confront our, uh, when we confront imposterism, when we can uh, confront imposter thoughts, uh, people can, we can help ourselves grow. We can help ourselves thrive. Uh, if we feel like frauds, uh, working harder and doing better and trying to uh, achieve this unattainable goal might not do much to change our self-image, uh, and it might just burn us out. Um, so here's what uh, our chaplaincy space, here's what Muslim space can offer, but here's some practical things that you can do in your, in your life to offset these. And again, I've left these intentionally generic that they can apply in the spiritual realm, they can apply in your practical realm, uh, in your job, in your mosque, in your relationship, all across the board. But here's what we have to offer here. First and foremost, acknowledge your feelings. Identify imposter feelings and bringing them out into the light of day can accomplish several goals. Uh, by, by definition, uh, Suzanne Imes, who's one of the uh, you know, leading uh, uh, psychologists in this field, lists that most people with imposter feelings suffer in silence. They don't speak about them. They don't talk about it. Part of the experience is that they're afraid that they're going to be found out. So talking to a trusted friend, a counselor, a mentor, chaplain, anybody who's a close confidant can help uh, just get some outside context and to help you process some of your thoughts. Sharing your feelings can help feel less overwhelming opening up to peers about how you feel encourages them to do the same, helping you realize that you aren't the only one who feels like an imposter. We do this very often in our spiritual connection groups with other people. We do this with our chaplaincy sessions, building connections, avoiding giving into the urge that you can do everything yourself, that you can figure out all of this yourself, and instead look to other people, look to community members, look to people who are also going through, because you'll realize how many other people are actually experiencing this. Uh, and remember that you can't always achieve everything alone. This network can help you uh, validate your strengths, help build you up and help dissipate some of those uh, distortions that we might have. Sharing these feelings with others, as I mentioned, can help make them feel that they are less alone. It gives an opportunity to share strategies to overcome these feelings and uh, related challenges that you might encounter challenge those doubts. When your imposter feelings come out, ask yourself whether or not they uh, there's actually anything to back this up. Um, like I mentioned, if you're applying for a promotion and you're like, no, no way, I don't deserve this uh, because I don't meet this, I don't meet this, I don't meet this. Think about um, all the consistent uh, encouragement and recognition that you're getting. Think about all these things, all these factors uh, that play in and not just your own doubts. And so avoid comparing yourself to others. This happens, uh, I don't know if this is a part and parcel of the uh, process of growing up as a Muslim kid or a Desi kid or whatnot. We're always compared to other people. If you're a parent, stop comparing your kids to other people. If you're someone who's been compared, stop comparing yourself to other people. Uh, everybody has unique abilities. You are where you are because someone has recognized your talents and your potential and you've, you've gotten to that place. And so you want to, you want to be sure to instill this in yourself. Uh, it's okay to need a little time to learn, you know, other things and, and to give yourself that space. But uh, just know that, you know, not, not everybody is the exact same. We're not all from the same factory, hardwired, the exact same. We're very unique. And so acknowledge this, that if someone's doing something else, great, something that somebody is doing something else better, awesome. Uh, it's not a reason for you to, uh, to deprecate yourself, that there's room for growth for you. And lastly, realize that no one is perfect. Um, the founder of the imposter phenomenon scale, uh, Pauline Rose Clant, said that uh, do a task well enough. Uh, and it's also important to take time to appreciate the fruits of your hard work, develop and implement rewards for success, learn to celebrate. And so the bottom line, successful people feel like frauds as well. Offering yourself kindness and compassion is something we absolutely must do. And uh, in our faith, Islam calls for trial and error. Islam is not one that says you must be 100% unpolished, perfect to get to uh, X, Y, Z. You learn as part of a process. You, you are the iron in the furnace that will get, uh, you know, the hot part of life that will be, um, you know, the, the scorching elements of life are going to come and hit. But you are going to find purification in those means. You're not just going to be born completely clean and live completely clean. You're going to have difficult moments. And so as we close out here today, uh, I close with a quote um, and a, a, a surah of the, uh, of the Quran. 
First off, uh, imposter syndrome expert uh, Valerie Young states that most people experience moments of doubt, and that's normal. And the important part is to not let that doubt control your actions. The goal is never to ne uh, not to never feel like an imposter. The goal for me is to give people the tools and insight and information to talk themselves down faster. She says they they can still have an imposter moment, but not an imposter life. And in the Quran, Allah says in Surah Duha, your Lord has not forsaken or abandoned you. Remember Allah is Al-Ghafar, Al-A'fu, Al-Tawab, Al-Latif, Al-Sabur. And as the Prophet Sallallahu would teach, Allah loves beauty. Allah loves beauty and is beautiful. And so for us, those of us struggling with belonging and feeling, remember Allah is patient and loves patience. Allah is repenting, or is, 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 the, uh, uh, is the one who accepts repentance and loves repentance, is the forgiving and loves forgiveness and is the gentle and loves gentleness. Um, inshallah, uh, I hope that this, this has been of benefit to us all. I apologize for going over time here, but inshallah, some benefit can be derived from this. We ask Allah to uh, allow us to leave this Jummah better than we came into it, and we ask Allah to uh, give us the strength to recognize our true talents, our true purpose, without doubting ourselves uh, in excess, and that we ask for hidayah, for guidance from Allah in times of doubt. Rabbana taqabal minna inna kan to Samir Alim, our Lord, accept this service from us, for Thou art all hearing, all knowing. Jazakallah khair. Some quick announcements uh, for um, the community. Just a note: we have our book club uh, that will meet uh, that meets monthly. It will meet tonight at 7 p.m. The book will be Mindset: The New Psychology of Success by Carol S. Dweck, um, and uh, you know we'll be meeting at seven o'clock on Zoom. So uh, if you, for more information, check out the Muslim Space website. We have a spiritual connection group coming up on Sunday. If you would like to attend, it is open for you to attend. And our topic is very timely. It's uh, emotion and faith. And we're going to explore the connection of these two uh, in the context of faith. So continuing some of this conversation there as well. Um, and let me see here. And yeah, so that's that's what we've got coming up for this week. Uh, I hope that you all have a blessed Jummah, inshallah, uh, and a blessed weekend as well. Jazakallah